housekeeping stuff, I want to thank uh, Salford, the Salford Group, for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Salford is, of course, known for their vertical tillage tools, uh, but obviously tonight we're going to talk more about their uh, cover crop applicators, the Valmar uh, 56 series. They also have the pole type air booms, uh, the BBI spreaders, airway, and of course their vertical tillage tools. So we want to thank uh, Salford for their sponsorship tonight. Uh, we'll talk a lot about Salford and, uh, and what they do. Dave Gunkelman is our Salford rep here in Ohio. And uh, he's also a big part of everything we do here with our cover crops at Fennig Equipment. So uh, hopefully he's tuning in tonight as well. So we're going to go ahead and get started, um, start moving through, uh, through the slides here and see what we can't get accomplished. So again, sponsored by the Salford Group. They are located uh, up in Canada. They've also got a location out in Iowa and BBI is located in Cornelia, Georgia. So like I mentioned later on, we're going to get Cody Beacom from Bird Agronomics on here. Cody is here from Ohio, uh, of course. Uh, I initially uh, met Cody at some of the, the uh, cover crop uh, kind of farm shows, the no-till conferences, stuff like that, and uh, thought his knowledge would be very helpful tonight. So we're going to bring him in later. Like we stated, you guys will all be able to meet him as well. Uh, here at Fennig Equipment, we do a lot of work, obviously, with cover crops and uh, whether it's setting up your corn planter, planting the actual cover crops, which we'll obviously get into, um, or rolling, even rolling the cover crops. But I want to show you guys the kind of territory that, that we cover. This is a view of the U.S. and the dots all represent a customer. Um, some of these could be Valmar cover crop seeders. Some of them could be planter setups. And then this is a zoomed in Ohio view of our customers. So uh, we want to be known as the go-to place for uh, cover crop seeding. Again, whether you need your planter set up for uh, planting into cover crops or you need an actual cover crop seeder, uh, we're here to help you guys uh, accomplish all of those goals. So getting into it, we are going to go over the four windows of cover crop seeding. And uh, when I say windows, I basically mean uh, side dress being the first opportunity to plant cover crops. And then uh, the next one would be, I've got those switched. The next one would be the combine seeder. So actually seeding as you're combining through the field. And I'm gonna show you that here in a second. And then your third option, or I'm sorry, your, your second option would be the interseeding with high clearance, uh, which with a Hagee sprayer, and then it'll be the combine seeder and then the post-harvest application, which almost everyone's familiar with the post-harvest. I mean, you can run a drill, uh, obviously a Valmar cover crop seeder through there uh, after harvest. So at Fennig Equipment, our main cover crop seeder, uh, if you guys are looking to get started with cover crops or maybe you already do it, are, is these Valmar 56 series boxes. They come in 1800 pound capacity and also 3,000 pound capacities. So uh, when it comes to how much they can hold, uh, we can hold plenty of product. We've got 40 cubic feet and 60 cubic feet. Um, then what we do is match them up with the application tool. So we can build a toolbar, we can put them on a Salford tool, put them on a Great Plains, put them on a Kraus, any type of tool you'll see in the next few slides, we can put them on. It has a hydraulic driven fan that blows the air uh, throughout the hoses. And it's got a either a ground driven, like you can see in this picture, that's a ground drive unit, or a hydraulic driven meter to meter the seed out of the bottom and blow uh, the seed throughout. And you'll see some pictures here coming up. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the guts of the Valmars and how they work. These were designed in the 80s to blow down dry herbicide and dry pesticide up in Canada. Uh, today, obviously, we use them more uh, for cover crops and also fertilizer. I've got guys that are strip tilling that put their micros in these boxes. So these boxes can be placed almost anywhere. We put one on a Jane and rolling basket last week. We've put them on corn heads, which you'll see. Um, they are, uh, I tell guys, if you plant your soybeans with a planter, this Valmar box will replace your drill very easily. We can plant wheat with it, plant cover crops, waterways, inter, uh, overseed hay fields, all that. 
Our other mode of uh, seeding would be our FE for our cover crop box. And that is a in-house made uh, cover crop seeder that goes on Hagee sprayers, goes on Miller sprayers, goes on uh, Apache sprayers. You'll see more pictures of this here in a little bit, but this is a box that allows us to blow 90 and 120 feet uh, across these high clearance sprayers. So this would be utilized in that uh, second opportunity and that is interceding with a high clearance sprayer right at that leaf drop and eardrop time frame. Now, this is a 140 cubic foot box with scales and basically how it works is it has a high pressured fan on it that pressurizes this box and then as the seed gets metered that pressure is released through the meter hoses and pushed out through the boom. That's what allows us to uh, to drive so far and, and blow the product so far throughout the boom. So we'll see more of that here in a second. Um, so again, a, a great picture of a Valmar on the back of a Hagee sprayer. I'll talk about this picture here in a little bit, but I wanted to show you another option for, for getting them on the Hagee squares. And for you guys, uh, we're, we want to touch base with everyone in, in the spectrum. Of course, I've got guys tuning in that have maybe never seeded cover crops. I've got guys in here that have seeded cover crops for five years and, and are looking for some new ideas. We're going to get into to some more of the in-depth stuff with Cody. Right now, I want to show you guys the equipment that we utilize uh, to seed the cover crops in this presentation. With Cody, we'll dive in deep and, and answer some of those tougher questions about what species I need to plant and when I need to plant. So opportunity one, the side dress seeding. Uh, this one is uh, you know, up in the air for a lot of guys. It's one that has become more popular over time, uh, mainly because you're already making a pass during side dress, whether you're running an anhydrous applicator, a liquid fertilizer applicator, uh, or whatever you're doing, uh, there is an opportunity there to get the cover crop started. Now, that, uh, that cover crop gets seeded, uh, and I'll show you some pictures here, either with a drill row unit or a broadcast or a rotary hoe uh, wheel to kind of chirp that dirt and get that stuff initiated. Um, we've built dedicated row unit toolbars, which you'll see here in a little bit. Um, but with every opportunity or every window of opportunity that we talk about here in a little bit, there's an upside and there's a downside. The upside to side dress seating is you're already making that pass. Um, if this opportunity fails, you still have three more windows to try. So it's that first opportunity and if it catches, the reward is huge. You could harvest that corn with some very nice cover crops come October uh, where no one else will have that established cover crop. Uh, a downside to this window is uh, that that cover crop has to live through the summer, whether we have a drought, whether we have a lot of heat or uh, wet weather, that cover crop has to make it through all of that. It has to go dormant because it's going to get shaded out for the most part and then it has to wake back up as those leaves drop uh, in, in mid-August <clears throat> time frame. So there's a lengthy window of, uh, of things that can happen to this cover crop but it, it can also be very rewarding. Again, make sure you check with your herbicide program if you're an agronomist uh, I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit of, uh, of some examples of that. So here's an example of a toolbar that we built for the side dress seeding opportunity. This is actually up in Minnesota. We built this toolbar and these row units. These are designed to go through the soil and uh, turn some of the dirt and seed the cover crops. Cover crops get seeded right in front of here and these blades work that crust, get it incorporated and this is the Salford SP6 hopper that feeds these row units. So this is up in Minnesota, a dedicated cover crop machine, um, <clears throat> a John Deere sprayer there that was converted to do cover crops. So that's a <clears throat> pretty cool outfit that we built there and just one, one of the designs that we did for uh, side dress seed. This right here is Salford's uh, 8700 air boom. This is designed for either fertilizer or cover crops. There are drops that can go on this boom 
to where you can intercede in between the corn rows to get your cover crops established. That would basically be a cover or a, a broadcast pass there with cover crops. Uh, this is our rotary hoe seeder. Uh, we've built several of these and it's a fairly cost effective way to get your cover crops established and incorporated at that side dress time frame. Now, granted, with this one, you'll be making an additional pass because there's no fertilizer on this toolbar. So you'll go ahead and do your anhydrous or your uh, liquid fertilizer application. And then as weather allows, you know, maybe you know there's some rain coming, you'll go ahead and seed with this. So basically, we just take the Yetter uh, rotary hoe and they, they offer them in segments of, of, I believe, five rows. And we put one segment of five per row and you go in there at a high speed, you can go down in between the rows, turn that dirt and seed the cover crops. We disperse the seed right in front of these wheels to where they get really incorporated and, and the seed has, has good seed to soil contact. If you're thinking of looking at the interseeding time frame. I urge you to look at this interseeder. Uh, this particular toolbar here is actually a demo machine that we have on our lot that I'd be willing to, to demo uh, to anyone out there that'd be willing to do it. So some things to keep in mind. Whoops. So this right here is a toolbar we actually built for Penn State. Uh, they have the Penn State row units on them. Uh, it was It's a very similar toolbar to the one that I just showed you, but we're using actual row units. So like a drill opener two row units per 30 inches fed with, of course, the Valmar cover crop seeder, ground driven. So you simply put the toolbar down, this ground drive wheel engages, fits the seed out, and it is uh, dispersed uh, throughout those seed units. So that is very similar to the rotary hoe one I just showed you. Uh, again, another way to get very good seed to soil contact at that side dress time frame. Uh, this right here is a little unique seeder that we actually built. Um, this is a 40 foot boom, three point mount seeder. Uh, this, anyone could build this really. This used to be a little three point sprayer. We took off the liquid tank, put the Valmar on it, and uh, it's got manual forward 40 foot booms. So you can go out there either in a post harvest application or these are spaced on 30 inches. You could go out there and at the side dress time frame and seed your cover crops. This would also work very good for soybeans as well uh, to go down there right before leaf drop. So this would be a very versatile unit, but uh, I've had a lot of requests for guys wanting a three point mounted boom system. And we have one. This is actually uh, located at our shop right now as well. So this particular customer, this is a 24 row uh, Case IH side dress applicator, liquid fertilizer. We built this last year, hung the Valmar seeder out the back, uh, fabricated some brackets, and uh, ran all the hoses up to the front. And we put the seed out right in front of this holder. And uh, then if you look here closely, he's got some, an, uh, some uh, yeah, anhydrous or liquid fertilizer sealers behind that holder to move the dirt. And that actually did a great job of incorporating the cover crops. Um, so blew the cover crops down, let it get worked in right here. And he did all this side dressing his crop and seeding cover crops in the same pass. So, you know, it could be as simple as this. The only attachment that he added to his side dress applicator was the Valmar cover crop seeder. He already had those closers. Um, so what I'm getting at is, you know, you can really utilize the products that you're already using, um, it, it doesn't have to be an actual row unit if you don't want it to be. Uh, you can simply utilize what you've got to get that cover crop seed uh, incorporated. You just have to be a little creative. And of course, the common denominator is always the Valmar cover crop seed. So this guy is actually located in Ohio. Uh, he, he met with his agronomist and they, he told him to just back off to one pound of atrazine per acre. That's what he did. And uh, he's got some pretty good growth. I, I believe I did a video of this, of him seeding this earlier in early July, I believe. And uh, the cover crop's actually looking pretty good today. So great opportunity there. So this is a 40 foot toolbar that went to Texas. Uh, this is the same scenario. Customer wanted to uh, 
one or two seed cover crops in standing corn. Um, basically, we're using the Salford row unit on this one. Salford offers a cover crop seeding unit as well. And uh, we're using the Valmar to seed and uh, incorporate that cover crop down into the soil. Uh, pretty unique uh, setup there. Two units per 30 inches. He's going to be planting all kinds of stuff with this, not just cover crops uh, down in Texas. So again, the Valmar seeder seeds all types of seeds. Very similar to a bar. This one's located very close to our shop. The customer is uh, going in there at the side rest time frame to get his cover crops established. That way, come harvest, he's got a great stand. And some of these guys are even grazing these cover crops. So uh, it works out to not only the soil's advantage, but also when you can graze them, uh, you can utilize the cover crops in several different ways. So that it was opportunity window number one. We're gonna move on to the harvest seeding. And this one is, uh, is one of my favorites. And yeah, I had to put in there, the soybeans that you throw out the back of your combine this fall don't technically count as uh, seeding cover crops. So, uh, but what I am talking about is getting a cover crop seeder mounted onto that combine. This is a very, uh, very good way, effective way of seeding cover crops. And for several reasons. You're already making that pass. You typically have some uh, extra guys kind of running around at harvest time. It doesn't take long to fill up that cover crop seeder. And also when you, and we'll walk through some examples here, but that, that uh, combine throws out a perfect mulch right behind that, right on top of that seed, just like you're seeding in your yard. And almost every time this seeding is successful because of that mulch that is laid on top of the seed. So we'll, we'll show you some examples here. This is the cover crop seeder that we make and design. Uh, it's, it's made to, to hang on the side of your corn head for uh, six and eight rows. We just use one of these boxes. One of these boxes holds uh, roughly 600 pounds of cover crops. And we put the uh, cover crop out underneath the corn head. It gets incorporated with that Yetter Devastator that you can see under here. That kind of works that stuff in. And then again, the, the corn head blows that shaft and, and fodder right on top of the seed and it works really well. Uh, this is one that we did up in Northwest Indiana. We mounted the Valmar out the backside of this Drago GT eight row corn head. This is a 900 pound capacity Valmar and they just put their seed tender in the same field. Whenever it needs filled, they drive over there, fire it up real quick and, and fill it up. It, they can do a complete fill up in around five minutes. And uh, as they're uh, harvesting corn, they're seeding their cover crops. So the day they're finished harvesting is the day they're done seeding their cover crops. It's a real slick way. It really doesn't obstruct much of your view right here. They're using a ground driven option. So it's really simple. And again, they have the getter devastators on that corn head as well to help incorporate that seed. So that is an excellent time frame uh, to be seeding cover crops that a lot of guys overlook is right on the combine. Works really well. So that was a short one, mainly because there's only one option for your combine seeding, and that is the mount of Valmar on the corn head or your bean head. And uh, it, it works really well. That's something that does take patience. If we want to talk the downside of that window, it's going to take some patience, that's for sure. There's a lot of customers out there that I throw that idea at that they shoot it down because at harvest time frame, everyone's go, go, go. But if you can take the time to do it, it's going to save you a lot of time in making the extra, extra pass post harvest. So we get into uh, one of the opportunity windows that's becoming very popular, uh, especially with our FE4R dry box, and that's the interseeding in the standing corn with a high clearance sprayer. So we're talking Heggies, Millers, even Apaches, and I've got some guys with John Deere sprayers doing it as well. But we're, we're mounting some type of dry fertilizer, dry cover crop box on those sprayers. So for us, mainly it's our FE4R dry box. We've mounted several of those uh, on Heggies, it's, it's a turnkey drop-in box that drops in place of your liquid tank. That sprayer is usually not being utilized this time of year. It's a great time to have a multi-purpose machine. Get your cover crop seeded that way. Southward offers a 
6700, which is basically that uh, dry fertilizer boom I showed you at the, at the very first uh, segment of this. Uh, I can find it here. And it is basically mounted onto right here. It's this on a, on a John Deere sprayer. So it's got a 60 foot boom on it. We can even go wider than that today. But uh, the Salford 6700 is a good opportunity there as well, uh, mainly specifically for John Deere sprayers. But this is done in the August time frame as the leaves are dropping, the corn starting to dry down. Uh, the downside to, to this one is you may need some rain at this time because we're broadcasting on top of the soil uh, because of all the heavy rain throughout the, the uh, growing year. That ground is going to be a little crusty, so the seed is going to kind of just lay on top. Um, downside is you may damage a little bit of the cash crop, even though it is minimal, but this one offers a huge opportunity for custom application. Uh, Cody could probably attest to this, but there's a lot of guys that uh, just have their cover crops custom done, and this is a good opportunity if you have a, a, a Heggy, a Miller, or a John Deere, get one of our FD4R boxes, seed your own cover crops, and you could almost make a business out of seeding several acres, especially when you look around and see it, all the bare acres from the uh, prevent plant that's still hanging around. Uh, perfect opportunity for someone to get out there and capture that. So here's our FE4R cover crop box. Again, it's a turnkey system. This frame drops right down on your frame. It's held on with the same four bolts that your, uh, your, dry, your liquid tank is held on with today. It's got scales. It's got the high pressure fan on it six or 10 outlet meter, it's a slick system. This is one that we did this summer, put the Valmar cover crop seeder on a John Deere sprayer. This customer is going to be blowing, I believe 80 feet with that and uh, interseeding cover crops. You can see he's got the drops back here mounted to his boom. Uh, perfect way to do it if you already have that sprayer. Here's one we did up on the Apache sprayers. This one's going 90 feet. Um, again, you've got the drops every 30 inches to go into that standing corn, load it up during a time where you're not typically using this machine, get it out of the barn and uh, put it to work. Here's one Mitch and I tackled last summer out in Illinois, put the Valmar 6056, so he's carrying 300 or 3,000 pounds of capacity and uh, he's going to blow cover crop 60 feet uh, to get those cover crops incorporated, utilizing some equipment that he already has. We see that a lot with our customers. Utilize the tillage tool you've got, utilize the sprayer you have, utilize that cultivator toolbar that's laying in the weeds, get it out, put some rotary hoe wheels on it and a Valmar cover crop seeder and you're off to the races uh, with some top of the line cover crop seeding equipment. Okay, opportunity number four, our last one is obviously the most popular. It's the easiest, it's the one everyone hears about but it can also be one of the trickier ones if we're up against a time crunch. Uh, this is the simplest way. You can whip out that 750 drill. You can get out your southward vertical tillage with a, a Valmar mounted on it. Um, anything can work at this time. Get out a spinner spreader if you had to, but uh, we're in a time crunch here. You know, today's October 10th. A ma good majority of Ohio's crops are still standing. You can't get in there to do this yet. And we're going to talk about this here in a little bit with Cody, but how long do we have until that window closes to where we can't really seed any cover crops anymore and be advantageous with them? Um, so, you know, the majority of our customers are seeding cover crops this way, but if, if the weather stays the way it is right now, we could have a great fall window of seeding, but again, a lot of our crop is still standing. So if it turns wet or turns cold, this one can get a little tricky, but we'll talk with Cody about it here in a little bit. So right here would be an example of a, a Salford Valmar uh, combination on a vertical tillage tool that we would use for the post-harvest application. This is a 24 foot tool that we actually have for rent available. You guys can rent to get your cover crops uh, seeded. This is the one actually in Desires, Ohio. We sold it to some customers that are they seed all types of stuff with this, oats, uh, rye, barley, and their cover crops with a 40-foot vertical tillage tool and a large southward uh, air cart. 
that'll cover some serious acres and, and get some serious cover crops growing. Again, the Salford 6700 is a great way to incorporate cover crops, spread out the boom. I actually just took this picture yesterday. Uh, this is where our uh, summer field day was located. We worked that ground all up and now we're seeding it down to some cover crops. We just got out the 60 foot air boom and uh, in no time we had that, that field seeded with cover crops. The Valmar cover crop seeder can go on any tool, whether it's a Case 330, Krauss Accelerator, Great Plains, of course it can go on the uh, southwards as well. But they have a three point mount option and also a pull type caddy option available. So uh, if you don't want it mounted on your tool physically, we can put it on your three point or also on your uh, uh, pull type if you have a rear hitch on your tool. Here's a nice little uh, Valmar 246. We just got one of these in. This is a 60 foot boom with a 3,000 pound capacity. It's real similar to this uh, large 60, or 8,700, but it's just a little bit smaller, designed for cover crops, uh, designed for uh, seeding uh, hay fields, grass. Uh, we sold one of these at the Farm Science Review up in Northern Ohio. Uh, so there's a lot of guys looking this way, but it's a really good post harvest opportunity. So that covers the four windows of application. Again, the side dress, the inner seating with a high clearance sprayer, the combine seating and the post harvest. I wanted to go over uh, and basically show you guys the equipment that we use for those four windows and how we've had success doing so. Um, obviously each window kind of brings along its own challenges and it also brings along uh, its own different equipment. But uh, that's the four windows. We're gonna jump in here with Cody and uh, talk with him here real quick. We'll get us switched over and uh, jump in with Cody here for a second. Hey, Cody, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. Can you hear me? I can. Yep. All right. Let me figure out how to get your uh, video on here and we'll be good to go. Can you open up your video? Let's see. I've got the screen right now. Is there a certain spot I need to go to open it up? Uh, under participants, if you look under panelists, and uh, your webcam is currently off according to that. While Cody's, while we're working on getting Cody's uh, deal up here, I'm gonna open up the polls uh, for everyone to see. So I did a poll uh, asking everyone a question, what, what are you wanting to learn the most about? Uh, when's the best time to seed covers, what species is the best to plant, or how do I plant in the cover crops in the spring? And, and Cody, the most popular uh, one was how do I plant into covers uh, in the spring? And that doesn't really surprise me, I guess. There's, uh, there's a lot of guys that are wanting to know how to do that. But uh, I think it, it does open a lot of uh, questions that we can jump into here in a little bit and uh,
Do you see a participants pad thing at the bottom, Cody? Yeah, I've got that up. It just it won't let me uh, open up the. It says I'm. Let's see here. Yeah, when I go to start the video, it won't let me to do that. It says I'm not a. Oh, let's see. There we go. Okay, we're live. Perfect. Awesome. So um, again, real quick, uh, let's tackle the poll. Uh, the poll that we did. So guys. Uh, they most wanted to hear about how do I plant in the covers in the spring? And we can both kind of attack that. But, uh, you know, when we plant stuff, let's go over this first. What cover crops that we plant today, Cody, would we have to worry the most about killing or planting into in the spring that can give us those nightmares that we've all heard about? Sure thing. Uh, cereal rye is certainly the elephant in the room just because of its size. And I think that's by and large the most common one folks would find problematic in the spring. Yep. But I think that's where it's so important to go back to the planning process. And if we simply just talk with a lot of other experienced folks around, there's a lot of great resources to connect with these folks. That's where we can kind of help to curb the anxiety quite a bit and figure out some tips and tricks, tips and tricks to help uh, make that process a lot more, uh, a lot more palatable. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I asked Cody some questions uh, early on about, you know, uh, do you favor planting and planting green or killing it first? And he mentioned, uh, you know, planting it green uh, is typically more favorable. And and do planting playing with some uh, planter attachments that we have. You know, I have guys that are doing both, um, and of course, each one can create its own challenge, but. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these uh, rollers and crimpers out there now available, um, but getting your planter set up correctly, not only on the front side, uh, row cleaners that can handle it, but closing wheels can also uh, play with that as well. So um, there's a lot, I mean, the how do I plant into covers in the spring, we can go on and on about uh, talking about how to tackle that. But uh, really, and, and I agree, I think, I think we just go at it green and terminate that let's let's let that run us into the next kind of topic uh, a lot of people have heard about getting burned planting corn into living cover crop why don't you talk us over why we see that long spindly corn when we plant into cover crops i think a lot of times that's a nutrient issue and it, it certainly depends what you have out there i know there's a lot of folks around especially here in my area that have had great luck planting corn into cereal rye and, uh, but I don't know that that's necessarily a place to start right away if you are a beginning cover crop or beginning uh, cover cropper. Yeah. So, with the, uh, what do you think about, you know, if, if they are going to plant corn into that cover crop, should they, how soon after planting that? Do they need to terminate that cover crop? I would say pretty quick. Yeah. C yeah. Certainly before it's out of the ground. I know some people, some people have tried a lot of different things, but I guess I'm, I'm going to focus more on the beginner in this instance. And I okay. think trying to plant, if you plant green, I would try and plant pretty much right behind the planter. I think that would be your best, your best option. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree. Otherwise you can get that long spin leaf corn or you run into some more nutrient issues. Uh, sunlight getting down in there depending on how tall that stuff is but uh, okay um, so the second most popular in the poll was what species is best for me to plant now that is a loaded question and, sure. and, and but let's talk let's talk about guys today that are going to be doing the post harvest that's probably our most popular window of seeding uh, a guy that's going into let's start with soybean stubble he wants to plant something that uh, is going to uh, live throughout the winter, uh, have a decent growth, and be manageable for next spring. Sure. So at this point, if you want something that overwinters in soybean stubble going to corn, our options are kind of limited at this point just because our, our, our weather window with any kind of heat is, is closing pretty quick. Yes. So cereal rye, is, is first and foremost the, uh, the prime cover crop pretty much from here on out. Uh, we also have barley, that's another great option. And I like barley because as a beginner, um, 
And also for some other reasons, it does not get quite as tall. And a lot of folks like that because if they want to plant green, but they're just not really sold on planting into something tall, that's a great fit. Now it's not okay. quite as hardy as cereal rye, but I think it's definitely a great fit. And you could also, you could even mix barley and cereal rye together. Got it. Uh, that helps to uh, do some other things. It'll, it'll offset our carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so next spring you spray those after you plant and then they'll decompose. Well, they'll release their nutrients at different times. So it's kind of like a natural spoon feeding of your cover crop. I see. I see. So, so go ahead. On top of that, we also have a few options for legumes too. You know, certainly uh, something to think about. We're breathing 78% nitrogen right now. We might as well use some plants, capture that nitrogen, put it in the ground and utilize it for our uh, cash crop next year. So legume options that we have at this point. Winter peas are a great option. Uh, I would like to see winter peas get in the ground. So if you're using that vertical tillage tool, great option. I would not just simply uh, broadcast them on top of the ground at this point. Yeah. If that is a route you're going to go, the clovers, say crimson clover or fixation clover, we still have a little bit of time to, uh, to get those planted as well to help fix some nitrogen. Uh, hairy vetch is another option to fix nitrogen as well. And uh, I really like that. It can pack on the nitrogen. Some folks are a little scared from it, but uh, other folks absolutely love it. So Got I it. think if you're starting out, I would probably recommend the clovers, potentially the peas. And then if you're wanting to, to get into something a little bit more, I don't know, I guess next level, hairy vetch would be another option, so. Yeah, so uh, back to the barley, you know, I, mm -hmm. I haven't heard a lot of that, but that would be a great option for, uh, for guys that don't wanna let, get that stuff uh, so tall. Barley would be a great option if it stays a little bit shorter. Um, so it's not quite as hardy. So this past winter was a little tough. Did much barley make it through? A lot of it had a really tough time. Yeah. We even saw some cereal rye killed out last fall. So Absolutely. It was tough. But I think the folks I've worked with that have used barley for quite a while, they've had pretty good luck. Seems like pretty consistently up to the end of October. After that, it's really kind of iffy. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was going to be a kind of my, my next question, you know, as, as the calendar is starting to turn, let's just say that I want to do a, a barley, uh, clover, and uh, um, what was your other legume, the radish? Uh, let's see here. We had the, the uh, clover, the crimson clover, fixation clover, vetch, and winter peas. Okay, let's do uh, peas barley yep. and the uh the crimson clover let's say i want to do a three-way mix like that at, sure. what would be your cutoff date here in ohio for for that mix in particular i would go at at the latest like the 20th or so of uh of october okay. and that's just kind of based on looking at what our forecast is the next couple of weeks from here on out okay um really once we get start getting past that things are really weather dependent you might have one year it works great, another year it might be an absolute failure. So mm -hmm. now would you say uh with if you were just on straight cereal rye, let's say, you know, there's a lot of guys that don't have anything harvested yet. Sure. Um, so you know, we're gonna be looking at guys that are are wanting to see cover crops into November. Um I've heard a lot of guys say that they planted some cereal rye really late and it didn't really start taking off until spring. Uh would that be a good option for these late guys? So I think that brings up a good point there. If you're looking to plant cereal rye with the intention of erosion control, but you're going to plant it late, that's, that's not really going to be accomplished, uh, you know, until it starts taking off come springtime. Yep. Sh sure, it might germinate, and, uh, but it's likely not going to get very big in that time frame. But, uh, certainly having some something out there is better than nothing but if like i say if erosion control is your goal that uh that's just probably not going to be accomplished just due to the, the time constraints at this point correct 
Yeah. So, you know, basically once you get past your suggested, you know, October 20th time frame, you're just planting some cover crops to give you something to kind of plant into this spring. Right. Next spring, I should say. Right. And, and, and one other thing we'll mention too, uh, last, actually, uh, it was the time period that was rough on a lot of the cover crops was actually prime for uh, frost seeding. And I think that's one thing that uh, a lot of folks don't think about sometimes, but I think it's a great, I don't know, it's basically a last resort option that uh, if you don't have time or, I don't know, you decide last minute you would like a legume uh, come springtime, that's a great time period to, uh, to put clovers out there, vetch, peas, or even oats. And uh, last, last spring, well, late winter, early spring, we had a lot of really aggressive freeze-thaw cycles. And that's what was a lot of hard, extremely hard on a lot of the uh, cover crops that were planted, but uh, were phenomenal for a lot of the frost-seeded crops that we uh, put in about that time. Okay. So worked out well. Okay. So specifically, what kind of time frame are you thinking? It, it honestly depends on the year. Okay. But uh, typically we're looking at like uh, late February, early March, about the time you just have uh, uh, thawing during the day and freezing at night. Yep. And, and we just had such a prolonged period this year that it was, it was great for that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be a, a great, great one. That's not one that, that many guys probably think about, but uh, you know, being a last resort one, uh, with all the, well, it just simply turned wet uh, last year or last fall. So that was, uh, so as, as we get pushed, our backs get pushed against the wall, we find other windows. And that sounds like that was one of them that, that kind of arose. Um, so uh, in, in the work that you're in, Cody, and with bird agronomics, um, what, what are some of the recent successes that, that you want to talk about uh, you've maybe seen guys that either weren't believers and you converted them or, or just uh, some really good practices that you've seen guys take that have just been really successful. Do you want to maybe talk about? Yeah, uh, I guess two particular things come to mind and, and one being the prevent plant situation this year. Yep. That really opened up a lot of doors for folks that might not have planted cover crops before yes. that, uh, that decide, you know what, we've got this window, we've not had a, an opportunity before, especially, you know, for corn and soybean farmers. So we're going to try something. And we've had some folks that in fact did that. And we started them simple, but found, you know, just a simple oats radish mix with uh, folks that may not have done a cover crop before has done phenomenal things. Yeah. So pretty excited about that. And they're pretty excited seeing good things out there and kind of just getting started in the, in the cover crop world with, with training wheels, you know, very easy to manage. And uh, so then I guess that leads to the next point. Uh, we've seen a lot of really good things with mixes. You know, you probably remember Adam five, six, seven years ago, there's a lot more monocultures, uh, single species planted. Yep. And we've really progressed into the mixes pretty significantly and it's pretty neat. It's, uh, I think that's a lot of the folks I've worked with past five, six, seven years have really transitioned into the mixes and are finding phenomenal things. It's kind of a uh, one plus one equals three. And the more species we get out there, the more benefits we find. So yeah. we'll talk about uh, some of the plots we have in, in Bucyrus where the uh, uh, no-till field day was this year. We were just digging around there last week and in the oats and radish plot, we had great growth, did good things. We get down in the subsoil and it, uh, it, it was still kind of tough. So we go down 50 feet to our other plot that had a 17 way mix in it. We get down in the subsoil and you can literally just push your spade right down in the ground. Really? So I think that's a testament to what cover crops are doing. Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, Basically, you're just saying you had just so many different varieties of cover crops in there that some would kind of work at the top, some would work at the middle, and some would get down there, and you would just have a mellow soil profile from top to bottom. Yep. And, and you're seeing a lot more of that with this 
uh, you know, three way, five way, 17 way, like you mentioned, uh, sure. mixtures. There's, there's definitely a lot to those mixtures and, and guys are, are always looking more and more into that. Um, that's something to really, really look at. Yep. And the cool thing with mixes is, you know, I've tried to, to have some set mixes and, and I think oats and radish certainly is kind of a standard, but yeah. we really kind of specialize in tailoring our mixes specifically to folks needs. And I think that's pretty important because one person might desire something different than somebody else. And the fact that we can do that, I think is pretty, pretty nice to be able to meet customers exact needs that way. Yeah, absolutely. And while we're kind of on the bird agronomics topic, why don't we talk a little bit about them, what they do, where they're located and, and how you got started with them. Sure thing. So I guess we'll kind of uh, start how I got into this and, I worked for NRCS back, geez, probably 10 years ago as an intern in college. And I really got interested in cover crops at uh, that time. So long story, but I ended up getting linked up with uh, the gentleman, Leon Bird, that owned Bird Agronomics. And uh, he was definitely a pioneer, kind of did a lot of the background work in getting this cover crop uh, movement started. And uh, had the opportunity a couple years ago to take over the business. And our, our basically focus is around the rhizosphere, the root zone in the soil. So we sell cover crop seed. We also sell some humic products, a uh, liquid and dry product, and also uh, inoculants as well. So. Got it. Yep. And, and you're, uh, what territory do you cover, Cody? Sure thing. Yep. So I'm based here in Mount Vernon. And our primary warehouse is actually up in Bowling Green. That's where we do all our mixing is up there and also have a location in Bellevue as well. So we're kind of spread out and uh, able to connect a lot of, a lot of points pretty easily. So. Got it. So if guys are in Ohio, Indiana, wherever they're located and, and they either want seed, maybe some consulting of your knowledge. They yep. just, uh, I was on their website actually just the other day, very useful website. Uh, you guys could find Cody's number and everything all his contact information uh, through there as well to get a hold of Cody in that aspect. Yep. So we probably should have done that first. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Hey, we, we got there, I guess. So, um, so what we just talked about some successes, what are some, uh, some big failures that you see time after time that are easily avoidable? Maybe not a question, I guess that, that we prepared for, but uh, I figured maybe in your line of work, uh, maybe, that could be easy to come by. Sure. Well, I, I think that's definitely things uh, that we need to be transparent about. I mean, everybody's kind of on this uh, journey and, and is learning, uh, learning a lot along the way. So anything that we can provide to help somebody from having a failure is very important. So I think some of the common issues that folks have probably re revolve around uh, what they plant or seeding rate. But, but, and let's stop and talk about seeding rate a little bit. A lot of times, uh, some folks are planting, we'll just, again, we'll use cereal rye as the guinea pig, maybe at a, an extremely high rate. And there's certainly some cases, say for uh, weed suppression, we might want to do that. But if you do that, you need to be prepared on the back end to have your planter set up to, to get through that. Yeah. And some folks, if they plant rye, say hundred pounds an acre, they find that they're not able to get through that. So I think that's where it's important to work with a, uh, a, a trusted uh, seed supplier that has kind of dealt with some of these issues and say, Hey, instead, if, if you, if you've got this goal in mind, let's throttle your seeding rate back, or we can add maybe some, uh, some clover or something else to offset that and make it a little bit easier to plan into. Yeah. So kind of based on planning, I, I think that's the next issue folks have some problems with is planning. Yeah. And, Again, that's where I think it's so important just to educate yourself as much as you can. There's a lot of great resource, resources out there. You know, uh, Conservation Tillage Conference is another one, National No-Till Conference. Heck, even there's the uh, Everything Cover Crops page. I think that's, yes. that's a place that, uh, that we can go get great answers from people all over the U.S. pretty quick and solid advice, typically. Yes. And, any, anything we can do just to help, I guess, prepare ourselves and try and limit our risks so we don't have failure. 
Yes. Or limit our failure, I guess. Yes. Yes. Uh, real quick, you know, even if you guys aren't really into much Facebook, that everything cover crops is, is big. I, I've seen, I've met some people on there. I've seen a lot of uh, people posting cool pictures and there's always chatter going on about, Hey, you know, this was successful or this wasn't uh, something really good to maybe tie into on Facebook. But, uh, but yeah, you know, the, the overseeding uh, rates is something that I kind of run into. We run into quite a bit in the spring. Guys will call us and say, man, I just, I can't get through this cover crop. And, and you know, we offer them solutions. And, and eventually we kind of get down to what rate was maybe seeded. And it's like, man, that, that, that's quite a bit. You know, maybe we tone that down for next year. And, and but, you know, everyone learns as they go. Um with your customers, Cody, you know, you, you sell a lot of seed. What's a common seeding practice that they do? You know, we just went through several uh, ways of seeding. You know, we didn't mention the airplane. Um, right. A lot of guys do that. We didn't talk much about the drill. What, what methods are you seeing popular? I think on our end, a lot of folks are still using a drill. Yeah. But I bet it's pretty equal parts of, a lot of the different practices you mentioned, uh, vertical tillage with the cedar is certainly a, a very popular option, especially yeah. because of its speed. Oh, it's yeah. in the ground, it's quick, and uh, cover a lot of ground really quick. Yeah. Um, a drill is another great option, again, to incorporate that seed. But uh, I think as far as our customers, it, it, it's pretty equal. There's no one, one practice that sets out above the other. Okay. What's your opinion on flying on cover crops? I like it because it's quick, but it's, it's very, very, very weather dependent. Yeah. Yep. So I don't know. I, if it's me, I don't think it's going to be my first option. Correct. Yep. And I've talked to a lot of guys that have shied away from that over time. I mean, of course we sell the cover crop cedars and a common conversation is, you know, I guys will just tell me I'm, I don't know that I want to make that phone call to the plane again this year. I want to try to get a little bit better at seeding my cover crops. And uh, that's a good option for them. Um, I have a lot of guys that you got, were you going to yeah, say I just, something? I was just going to add one more thing on that. Yeah. To yeah. The, the airplane, it's a great option just because you can get so many acres on so quick. But if you could, if you could line that up ahead of a significant rainstorm, I think then it's a, it's a great option. Yes. But uh, it, again, it's just, it's very weather dependent. And I'll use this fall as an example. Um, had a lot of acres flown on, then it was just the rain turned off, it was super dry all through September. Yeah. Whereas if you might have been able to get something into the ground on, say, prevent plant ground um, or wheat ground that might still have been open, you might have been able to get to some moisture and get something going. So Correct. just things to think about. Yeah. And, you know, the plane can cover so many acres in a day that you could play with the weather. You know, hey, if we're getting rain, which Ohio is looking like they might here this weekend, mm -hmm. you could maybe seeded, may have seeded all of your acres just today using yep. the airplane. So could be beneficial to, to get that stuff established. Um, I have a lot of guys that talk to me about annual rye versus cereal rye. Yep. Uh, why don't we dig in and dissect those two? Okay, so annual rye gets a really bad rap sometimes. Yes. And it's unfortunate because it probably really is one of the best cover crops, but it also takes very specific management to deal with. So okay. I guess simply put, it's not for everybody. Okay. Uh, I do not recommend annual rye grass for people who do not do their own spraying. Just okay. because if you can't get out there at the proper time and, and, and uh, take some proper precautions, it can in it can turn into a, a problematic issue. Um, so let's back up a little bit and talk about cereal rye versus annual rye. And I think the easiest way to put that is uh, cereal rye has the above ground growth. And if you flip that over, annual rye has a significant amount more underground growth. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly why there's a lot of problems with folks uh, controlling annual rye grass sometimes because if they go in at the wrong time or don't take proper precautions ahead of time, they're trying to kill something that's got a very limited amount of top growth, but a very, very, very significant root system. Got it. And if you don't, if you don't get it at the right time, you're just going to make it mad and, and really cause yourself problems later. But 
like I say, with that much root mass underground, you're doing tremendous things, especially if you have compacted soil and, uh, or maybe some type of a hard pan in there. There's not much better than annual ryegrass for that. So. Okay. And I've heard some guys say that, you know, if we dig into what you're talking about, about how to kill it, I've had a lot of guys tell me that you have to wait until you have enough above ground leaf for that spray to activate and kill it. Is that true? Yeah, so kind of the rule of thumb is the second time you mow your yard in the summer or in the early spring, uh, that's about the time you want to control your annual ryegrass. Okay. And that, okay. that way the plant's good and actively growing and you can get that herbicide down in and, uh, and get the plant controlled. Because uh, okay. sometimes folks get out there too early and it's got a very waxy leaf on it, so it, it can be hard for the herbicide to get into the plant. I see, I see. So for guys that are wanting to, you know, the, the veteran cover croppers, you know, that spray their own ground and want to really dive in and, and uh, dig into annual ryegrass, they, they can do so. And there's probably, of course, several doing that. Yes. But uh, it's just not one that we're going to suggest to the uh, beginner. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Um, is there anything uh, that is specific about this year? or this fall, you know, we, we run into some times where we have an early fall or late fall and this product's better than the other. Is there anything specific about this fall or what we've got going on right now that you're suggesting to people that's different than other years? Not really. I, I think we're to that point now where uh, we're kind of, I guess, back to the point in time where we're about like a normal year. Yeah. Uh, the only exception would be prevent plant ground. Yep. And there, I know there's certainly, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of acres uh, that were prevent plant this year that, that do not have something in them. And I wouldn't discount them uh, as being not eligible for a cover crop at this point. I mean, it's certainly, we still have time to get something out there and, and you Absolutely. still stand to gain a lot of benefit. So. Absolutely. That'd be perfect ground to put some of that barley and uh, maybe some vetch and certainly and, uh, some of those legumes out there right now and get it going. Yep. Um, so we talked a little bit about feeding at side dress. Um, what do you think about that time frame? And uh, have you seen failures and, and successes with it? Yeah, so at side dress time, uh, interceding there, I'll be the first to admit that's something I don't have a tremendous amount of experience with. But I have talked with a lot of folks who have. And, and if somebody on here has questions, I can certainly point them in the right direction. But uh, actually, just talking with a, a friend of mine tonight who did, in fact, uh, intercede, uh, he did uh, some 60-inch corn. So he blocked off for every other row on his planter, did 60-inch corn, and uh, they came back in with a white uh, split row planter and uh, seeded a mixture of, let's see here, I think it was oats, flax, uh, radish, and uh, turnips, and uh, shoot, something else about uh about v about uh, v2 or three and it looked tremendous so uh certainly a lot of a lot of promise to interceding but uh, also a lot of questions too yeah yeah even you know it, it can i've seen some guys have been some inconsistent uh years with it as well um yes. of course the big question there is what do you do with your herbicide you know i don't have the perfect answer for that but i know my one customer with that case side dresser he did, they limited it to one pound of atrazine and he seemed to get, get along very well doing that. Um, of course that won't work for everyone. And, and that was the interesting thing. Uh, the, the gentleman that did this, uh, he had some thistle issues. So he sprayed on that, uh, on that ground. He interceded on the 60 inch corn, uh, five ounces of Hornet and also uh, 2.6 quarts of bicep. And he said he wasn't even sure the cover crop would come up. But uh, he th was thinking because they got it in the ground with the planter, that helped them uh, tremendously in, in getting a nice stand with the cover crop, and it worked. It looks phenomenal. So that that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so we just had a, a question pop up here in the chat. Is there any issue to be aware of with interceding in the southern states? This. Uh, guy is from southern Colorado. Any issues to be aware of with interceding in the southern states? 
I, I don't know if it'd be any different than the issues in Ohio. Yeah. I'm um, just trying to think of the soils out there and the weather conditions. Um, again, I would think as long as you can get moisture to the seed, that would be your biggest concern in that, in that type of environment. Um, I, I would think so. Probably trying to get it in the ground would be much better than, than a broadcast type application in that, in that case. Definitely. And, and of course on the herbicide stuff, meet with, with an agronomist or someone who's familiar with that stuff to, to figure out what is going to work best to of course control some weeds, but allow the cover crops to grow kind of like the scenario Cody was just talking about. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, oh, he's got irrigation. So heck that's, oh, okay. um, he said, he's just worried about when the hot days on the hot days that they get, uh, the highs get nineties and the one hundreds. Uh, so I've got a similar scenario to this. Maybe that, uh, inner cedar toolbar that went to Texas, uh, that I showed on the screen, that gentleman was actually interceding, uh, mainly to shade the ground to keep the ground cooler. Uh, he was doing a lot of broadleaf and legumes and he was under pivots as well. Okay. And so he doesn't have a problem with them growing, uh, but he was utilizing the cover crops to keep his soil cooler and to uh, maximize his irrigation. So that stuff is evaporating. What do you say? A lot of times they would evaporate roughly an inch of water a day. He was utilizing the cover crops to, uh, deter that eva evaporation and, and maybe uh derek you can be doing the same thing but uh heck if you're under pivot i'd say you're gonna go but uh yeah i think uh heck yeah what do you think cody got anything else that's all i've got okay um well, of course, I want to. I think we're going to wrap up here, unless anyone has any more questions. I think we did a, a good job of covering uh, some really good topic topics with Cody. I want to really thank him for jumping in on this tonight and taking the time. I really want to thank everyone for uh, uh, attending the webinar tonight. This was recorded, so uh, I'll be posting it on uh, Facebook, um, uh, probably YouTube. And there will be some links to get to it on our website as well. So if you guys know of someone who wanted to watch it, maybe they're out in the field tonight, uh, it's recorded. But uh, I want to thank Sauerford again for their sponsorship in tonight's webinar. Uh, Bird Agronomics and Cody Beacom. Cody, any last words? Nope. I appreciate uh, everybody's time tonight. And uh, there's a lot to learn, but let's learn together and uh, keep making good things happen. Yeah, I'd say this is uh, the first cover crop webinar of several. Again, I think there's topics we can dig in on and, and spend a, a few hours on. So I look forward to maybe having a few more webinars in the future. And, and stay tuned to Fenning Equipment or Bird Agronomics and Cody uh, to learn more about cover crop seeding and, and all aspects of it. So thanks for tuning in, folks. That's it for tonight. Thank you.